title of my message today is Faith is Not Always Safe. Faith is not always safe. The scripture says that faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It's dead. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. And a verse that has This verse has been one of those, um, I want to use the word motivator, but it's, it's bigger than that. This verse is, verse is a real challenge for me, and it's in Hebrews, and it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And like I said, it's not just a motivator, it's, it's inspiring, but it also, it, it challenges me. Because I want to please God. And it comes back to the, the thought do I have faith? What is faith? Do I have enough faith? Here, here we go with this list of questions. Without faith, it's impossible to please the Lord. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about faith is not always safe. Living by faith is not always the safe way to live. It's it means embracing the tension between human reasoning and obedience to God. Let me say that again. Living by faith, has, it's a struggle. It's embracing the tension between human reasoning and obedience to God. I was reminded on the front row just a moment ago when I was about 20, I was at the Guadalupe River. We were tubing and swimming. Janet and I had been married a year or two. And I love the sound of the raging water. You know, the babbling, not just a babbling brook, but the raging turmoil of the water. And it's fun when you're watching it. I found myself, however, that day going down this chute that was made, you ride your tube through it, and I lost my tube on the downward trek, and I hit that raging, turmoiling water without my chute, and I couldn't find my way out. I couldn't see anything. I was tossed. I was tumbling upside down, right side up. I didn't know which way was up. I kept trying to swim out of this current I was in. I could not breathe. I was underwater, it seemed like, forever. I thought, literally, I was about to drown. I finally let my body go limp, thinking I would, it would throw me out of the current, or I would sink to the bottom where I could kick off. I, I didn't know where I was. None of that happened. And I would go back to trying to swim again with no air, losing air, swallowing water, and finally, what seemed like an eternity, I saw my whole life go by. I didn't have any children, but I saw, I just saw things. It's amazing, a flash, and it finally kicked me out of that water. And people that I love and know were watching me in the river, but could do nothing. They could see. And while I was in the middle, it was horrific. I love watching the raging river. 
I was so glad when I got out on the other side and I could breathe again. And I didn't go back down that chute anymore either. But while I was in the middle, that's where some of us feel we are right now. And you're doing everything you can to breathe. Some of you struggle with recurring tests of your belief system as a Christian. One, it's either a faith issue. In other words, you're not sure God can be trusted. Or you have a lack of understanding of what the Bible says about living by faith. In other words, you're not sure what God expects of you as a follower of Jesus. I I think some of us simply struggle with self-discipline and consistency to exercise the faith that we've been given, which can be perceived as laziness and a lack of priorities or concern. I have found that living by faith means praying bold prayers. Bold prayers. So I'm sort of posing a question. Well, I'm not sort of posing. I'm going to ask you one. Are you playing it safe when it comes to obeying God? Are you willing to take bold risks for him? Or will you continue to play it safe? Because without faith, (laughs) it's impossible to please God. And that verse goes on to say, for we must believe that he is who he says he is. And that he rewards those, he rewards those who haphazardly, thank you, he rewards those who haphazardly, is that what it says? No. It says he rewards them who diligently seek him. Faith is not always safe. Another way to say it is stepping into faith is is always a risk. Now, I had a hard time with that word risk when it came to God, but the bottom line is, faith is another word for risk. Now, here's my first story. 1 Samuel 14. God's people are hiding in caves from the enemy called the Philistines. Jonathan is King Saul's son, and he has an armor bearer. They're buddies. The armor bearer is with him 24-7. Jonathan's tired of running and hiding, so he has a conversation with his armor bearer, we don't know his name, and he convinces him to join him in a two-person raid on a military outpost of the Philistine army. Now, an outpost is a small group from the larger army looking out, right? If you read the verses, it tells us there's about 20 guys, says the scripture this way, 1 Samuel 14. Let's go over to the outpost of this, of those uncircumcised fellows. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder him from saving us. So let's talk about this. If, if you're trying to convince me to join you in doing something bold and dangerous, I'd like for you to say something a little better than, well, maybe. (laughs) In one breath, Jonathan offers two opposing positions. He says, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving us. He can do anything. And maybe he will. It's the tension that I'm 
I was talking about a moment ago that we have to embrace if we're going to live by faith. It's a constant tension. Jonathan is saying what every one of us say often. I know God is able to do anything, and I hope he's willing to do it. I know he can, and I'm pretty sure that he will, but I can't be completely sure how things are going to work out because faith it's not always safe. Faith is not the absence of uncertainty. Very important for some of us because sometimes in our uncertainty we struggle and the enemy will say you just don't believe. Faith is not the absence of uncertainty. It simply believes that God's promises are bigger than my perhaps. God never doubts. You have to understand the posturing here. God is always able, and sometimes we don't believe. Perhaps means there is uncertainty, but perhaps also means there is a possibility. We all must accept that in the land of faith and bold prayers is where promises from God, and perhaps from us coexist. I know he can, and maybe he will. But I have faith, and I gotta know faith is not always safe. Now here's my second story. It's also in the Old Testament. It's found in the book of Daniel. In Daniel 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been ordered by King Nebuchadnezzar to bow in worship to an idol that the king had built for himself. And if they refused, they would be thrown into a furnace of fire that had been heated 10 times hotter than normal. So I guess they had a normal heat where they threw people in. Then they had the 10 times hotter heat for the people who didn't bow. I don't know, that's what it says, right? So they didn't bow and Nebuchadnezzar was upset to say the least. So here's what it says in Daniel 3.16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to King Nebuchadnezzar and they said, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. Furthermore, O oh king, he will rescue us from you. But even if he doesn't, but even if he doesn't, <laughs> he can. But even if he doesn't, we will not serve your gods or worship the image you have set up. We worship God, period. So faith creates a tension that you and I simply have to learn to struggle through. So on Tuesday, we do another PET scan. For those of you who wonder if I know what I'm talking about. We do a, a PET scan to see where Janet is at on this journey with cancer. Been fighting it for many years. So there's a side of me that says maybe it's going to be better. There's a side of me that says I know God can eradicate cancer and nothing show up on the scan. There's a side of me that says I hope that this pain goes away and that these nerves are healed, that these tumors have damaged so that she can get the use of her left arm again. And on the other side of me, I know God spoke to the withered hand and said, stretch it out, and it was healed. But in the middle, we like it from this side looking in like, man, I love it when God's doing miracles, the raging river, I like the sound. It's amazing when God's doing great things. And then if you get out on the other side, you're like, man, I'm so glad I can breathe again. But some of you are in the middle. Yeah. 
So some of us keep asking God to rescue us. This is gonna sound a little contradictory maybe because I'm, we don't like it in the middle. Let me say it that way. We, we don't like the middle. And so we ask God to rescue us. And, and, and what God's trying to do is tell you life has this side, that side, and the middle. There's, <laughs> there's the faith I say I have. There's the faith I did have. But there's the faith you learn to live in. And when we want God to rescue us, sometimes because of life things happen, in the middle he wants you to stand in your faith, which is not always easy or safe. The image in my mind won't go away. It's the movement of an egg of a baby chick trying to peck its way out of the egg at as it matures, you can't break the baby chick from its shell or it is sure death. The, the chick must endure the struggle to gain the strength to stand upright with a stiff neck and feed itself. What God is asking of you will not always feel safe. Faith requires risk. Faith requires obedience. We say, but I just don't see how we can do this or how this could happen. Faith is hope that is not yet seen. It is trusting God and being obedient even and more so when it doesn't make any sense. I don't need my fog lights on my vehicle when there's no fog. To turn them on when there's no fog is just letting people know I'm big and bad and I'm coming through. I got all my lights on. I don't need faith. It's easy to talk about it when everything is clear and everything is beautiful. But I'm afraid, Pastor. I'm afraid. Is fear a sign that I don't have faith? I hope not. I said, I hope not. Because I've been afraid. I was afraid yesterday. I was thinking about this PET scan yesterday. Human fear. Human faith. Maybe. Perhaps. Hopefully. I know he can. I know he, and hopefully he will. It's not wrong if you feel fear. It's wrong to let fear have the last word. That's when the Lord reminded me yesterday that he spoke to the man with a withered hand and he stretched it out. And I declared that in Jesus' name. When I thought about Janet, and maybe you don't even know, but she can't use it. These fingers are drawn up and she can't use her arm. There's just all this damage in here. And so she, it's in pain and it bothers her 24-7. And I was driving and I was upset in my natural as a husband because I can't fix it. And I'm in the middle and I'm praying for her and I'm interceding for her. And I feel the tension of that. I'm like, God... You spoke to the man with a withered hand. I'm looking at that, and I, just, and I said, that's the last word in Jesus' name. So be it. You, you can't stop having fear. You just have to learn to, to push through that fear and not let fear have the last word. You see, those who accomplish big things for God's glory aren't people who feel the least fear. Well, they must have been a, a giant. No, they were probably the most scared. Often the ones who, who deal with, who do big things for God are the ones who have the most fear. <laughs> Did you know, let me mess everybody up. Did you know that most effective leaders are only about 65 or 70% sure of a decision they make? Oh my, I didn't know that. I was scared as a 26-year-old young man when I drove into this town in 1987 to start this church. I was a, what am I doing? I was scared when the doctor said, 
It was 1.13 on a Thursday afternoon. I could see the big round clock and the little hen ticking. And he said, she's got stage four metastatic breast cancer and it's in her lymph nodes. I was scared 12 years ago when cancer came raging back. But that didn't stop our faith or our trust in God. Because I know he is able. Are you listening to me? And I hope he does it. Instead of letting fear disable your dreams, you have to increase your capacity for faith and risk. Let me say that again. Instead of letting your fear disable you and your hopes and dreams, you have to increase your capacity for faith and more risk. It seems almost counterintuitive but it's when the pressure is on <laughs> I lean in in more faith does that make sense it's like when you're like oh I don't know what's going to happen and I get back at you but faith is not always safe we want to get to a safe spot and so there's an inclination to go to a to, I'm just going to stop right here I ain't doing nothing else I ain't changing nothing I don't want nothing because I want to be I need to get safe again and God's like lean in You're already out of control. Why not just jump off the deep end? I remember the first time, I honestly, I walked out on the high diving board at Jacinta City swimming pool, and that thing was like 14 feet over the water, and I was about nine. And everybody's in line behind you, and they're encouraging you to jump. Some are pretty mad, like you're standing up here. Listen, we already started this journey in faith. Why would we stop now? I, I know he can, O oh king, and he's gonna deliver me from your hand, but even if he doesn't, we're not gonna bow. We're gonna worship God. And that's final. So the way you increase your capacity for faith is you act on the part of God's direction that you understand and you leave the rest up to him. <laughs> because if you think you got to understand it all to act on it, you're going nowhere. You embrace the tension that I know God can and perhaps Maybe he will. So how do I trust God and stand in faith when it doesn't feel safe? You simply step into the fear. You take the chance and you obey God knowing that whatever the outcome, he's gonna be able to take care of you. You resolve to keep believing. You keep believing until his promises outgrow your perhaps and your maybe. But pastor, what if God doesn't show up like I want or like I expect or I hope for him to? That's the unanswered question. <laughs> I actually pretty much have stopped asking that question because here's what I, I guess concluded. If he told me I'm gonna stop it in 10 more years, I would look at him and say, well, if you can... That would not be good enough. Are you with me? God answered me, but it's not the answer I want. Well, if you can do it in 10 years, why don't you do it in 10 minutes or 10 seconds? You see, that's the whole thing about living by faith. You go on what you understand. You know that what you know about God and the rest you have to leave up to him. You live by your faith. You stand strong in what his word has said to you already. This is when you learn to keep believing for what has not happened yet. Bold faith is about trusting God in the middle of your situation, especially, especially, and even more so when we don't know how it's all gonna work out. So, here's my question. What bold act of faith and obedience 
is God asking you to take? Now, some of us get thrown into situations like cancer. You didn't choose it. Stay with me for just a second. Some circumstances, I didn't ask for that divorce. I didn't ask to be terminated. I didn't ask you know, on the job. I, some things you get thrown into, but then there are some decisions of faith that we learn to step into. I hope that out of this message, you don't only hear that I'm living in this place of faith because of all the struggles that life has put on us. I am there, like all of us are there, in all the areas that life brings. So I struggle, and I trust God. I, I struggle in that moment. But then there are also times when God calls me to a higher place, usually in the middle of while something over here is happening that I didn't ask for, he asks me to step into a higher place of faith and be obedient to him because there's something he sees that I don't see. And so while I'm battling in my struggle of what life has done or life has thrown my way, I'm also stepping into a new element of faith where I'm believing God for things that I don't see clearly but he's saying if you'll be obedient I got things in store for you but you got to take the first step so in what area of your life are you playing it safe when it comes to obeying God is it trusting God to guide you through the current marriage crisis you're in and you're holding back and she knows it Is it, for those of you who are still at home facing the fears of this pandemic, and even us in this room, believing God's gonna keep you and protect you, and you're holding back? Is it trusting God with the money that he gives you? Do you struggle to give the tithe consistently and bring offerings to give back to God? This struggle, this tension of faith and belief and trust and disbelief and unbelief and hopefulness and obedience and boldness and weakness. So let me ask a very simple question, and it's out of the, the purity of my heart. I hope you hear this. How can you trust God with your eternal salvation and not trust him with the money he gives you? And I asked myself that question this week, and the Lord reminded me that more than anything else, Jesus talked about money than he talked about prayer or love or forgiveness or salvation or hope. He talked about money. Why? Because he knew he got everybody's attention because it related to everyone. Now, our salvation is absolutely free. We can trust and believe Jesus paid for all of our sin and yet struggle to trust that he's gonna take care of us when we give him what he asks. This tension. So here we are in life, believing God. And by the way, I just believe God answered some prayers a moment ago when we sang and worshiped and prayed together. Some of you got an answer, and even if you don't see it manifested yet, you need to claim that answer, and you need to walk it out. Joy comes in the morning, the scripture says. Oh, come on, somebody, if you're believing for an answer, yeah, and, and if you believe in somebody else got the answer, healing, miracles happen. Now, your healing may take time. Your miracle can be instant. So if you wake up in the morning and... You're still feeling the pain? You just claim your healing in Jesus' name. And on the other side of all of this, if God is challenging you, if he's calling you higher, let me, let me try to put this in perspective from a leader and a father and a pastor and a husband and all that, okay? So Jan was diagnosed with cancer 24 years ago this past May. We went through all that and then 12 years ago this past May, cancer returned, and it was 
worse than ever. It was a miracle she got through it 24 years ago, let alone living 12, 13 years. Then it comes back and she's still alive and it's just crazy. The doctors are, they're, they're dumbfounded. They don't have a plan. We're just talking and we're practicing medicine. Literally. And Jesus is on the throne and she's still alive and here we are. I mean, so, but here, here's what I'm trying to say. Leading this church 12 years ago, 10 years ago, nine years ago, I'm trying to lead our church family in faith and struggling personally with a family issue that there's tension in my faith, right? So that's why I'm saying, I'm talking to you because I know, I'm trying to help you as a man, but as your leader, as a pastor, but I'm also a dad and a husband and a grandfather and a brother and son and all that. Attention. We needed, we needed this building to be built. And we needed $6 million to build a building. So uh, the church was grown and we needed more space. We were in the annex and we were doing multiple services and had been for years. And we just, it was time for a new building. And I, something came over me. I'll never forget the day it happened. I was preaching in that building, the annex. It was full of people. We could hold about 650 people in that room. And we filled it up several times on a Sunday. It was full of people. And something came over me that Sunday. I said, I feel like Moses when God told him to step on the water and it parted to lead his people across. And I stood in that, that building. This building didn't exist. And I stepped like that. And when I did something in the spirit of God, in the spirit realm, ignited. So you're here and you're sitting in this building today, but in the middle of the greatest and still in the middle of our greatest, my greatest personal battle ever. 24 years of stage four metastatic breast cancer. There's some physicians in the room or nurses and She's not supposed to be here. Science says she's not supposed to be here. But in this ongoing struggle of human where I fear and I get angry and I get upset and I say, God, and I try to, the devil tries to get you to step back, say, what is happening? And in the middle of all that, you know what God does? God, he, something goes off in me and I'm like, devil, you are a liar and I am not going to back down to anything that you're trying to throw in front of me. That's just a smoke screen. Our God is able. Our God is able. Able, our God is able and so we started digging down and we started giving our biggest offerings and we started making our greatest sacrifices and we got a team of people together and we're like we're going to build a building and we're going to raise some money and we're going to believe God because he wants to save people and there needs to be a house for people to gather in and so in the middle of that deepest darkest loneliest time and it still comes because she's still in it and we got a pet scan on Tuesday and I don't know what it's going to feel like on the other side on this side over here I'm saying and on December the 5th, we got a legacy offering and Janet and I are gonna give our biggest offering and we're gonna face the devil and we're gonna look him in the eye and say, you're not taking anything away from me. We're building the church of Jesus. We're gonna be givers. We're gonna be investing. We're gonna stand in faith. We're gonna take a risk. It's not always safe, but we're not backing down now. It's full speed ahead for Jesus. disciples had been following Jesus for a period of time. In fact, there was a whole crowd of people that had followed Jesus. The crowds were coming out and Jesus looked at the crowd and he said, what's the real reason you're here? You know, it's pretty straight when Jesus just looks at you and says, why'd you show up? What, what, what are you expecting? What, 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 what brought you here? Are you just an onlooker? Are you an observer or are you a participant? And then he spoke some pretty strong language 
to the followers, like, if you're not here for the right reason, then why are you here? Well, then the Bible says the crowd walked away. <laughs> sometimes sometimes you, you, you teach or you speak straight to people and they're like, oh, I'm out of here. I didn't, I didn't expect that. And so they left. And then he turns to his disciples. And here's my point. He looks at his disciples <laughs> and he said, they want, you know, so here's Jesus' followers. They've been watching all this happen. And they're like, oh, the people just left. And then he looks at them and he says, what are you going to do? Are you going to stay or are you going to go? Why are you here? And Peter said something that has been words for me in my darkest moments. Peter, you know, was kind of the outspoken one. And he blurted out, where else are we going to go? You have given us the words of eternal life. What alternative do we have? We're not going anywhere. I may not understand what just happened, but I'm hanging on to you. I'm with you because that's the safest place I can be. Twelve years ago when this thing came back, was standing in my closet on our way to get the report. We didn't know it had come back. We knew something was going on. And we're on our way to the doctor's appointment and I'm standing in my closet and it came all over me and I said to him, Jesus, I don't know what I'm about to hear. and I don't know what's about to happen, but you can count on this. I may not know where you're at, but I know that you know where I'm at. And I'm not going anywhere, and you're stuck with me no matter what. And here we are 12 years later, and here we are in a beautiful building, and here we are facing our legacy offering, and here we are again where we have an opportunity. Now remember what I said in the beginning, that faith without works is dead. Did you know Jesus said this in Matthew? <laughs> he said, let your light shine before men. He didn't say only let it shine when you're in the good times. He, he said, doesn't matter if you're in the dark. Let it shine. Let, stay with me. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds, your good works, and glorify your Father in heaven. When do they glorify God? When they see you persevering through your unbelief and struggling in your what if and maybe and perhaps, but you're standing saying, I'm gonna be obedient to God. I'm gonna follow God. I'm gonna do what God says. I'm gonna listen for God. I don't care if I don't understand it. I don't care if I can't make sense of it. Faith is not always safe, but with God, I'm in the safest place. I can always be in the palm of his hand. So December the 6th is a couple of weeks away. God's talking to us. He's been talking to me. He's talking to you. Let, let me say this, I, just for a moment. Did you know that in some of our darkest moments of faith challenge has been Janet and I personally, our greatest natural rewards of blessing and favor? Look, so did, you're looking at me like, what do you mean? In some of our deepest, darkest time, when I would write a check, it didn't matter the amount to help her get healed. It wouldn't matter. Whatever I could afford, I'd give it all for her to be healed. I haven't had to do that. Thank God for Blue Cross. <laughs> and high insurance premiums. But in our darkest moments, it's when Janet and I have committed to God our greatest sacrifices, and he provides always when the time is needed. So I can't explain it to you, 
It's I know he can and perhaps he will. I know he can, perhaps he will. Oh, king, we ain't bowing. God's gonna deliver us from you. And even if he doesn't, oh well, we're on our way to heaven. I mean, the devil's already lost. God's already won. But you have to, if you wanna be in the middle, you wanna be in the part of that step out in faith. So I ask you to pray. Ask God what he wants you to give because he'll tell you. I ask you to prepare for that. Get your stuff together. Janet and I, have been, we've been preparing for it. Know what we're going to bring. And it's, it's, sorry, I'm doing some math in my head, but the Lord's providing something that we never dreamed that we're going to try to do. In the middle of her, to got a pet scan Tuesday. Oh, should I hold back? No, man, this is the time to release it. Say, God, I am stepping up. Devil, you're a liar. Jesus is on the throne. I'm believing you. Faith is not safe. I'm stepping out in faith. I'm believing you to provide. There's more to come. You don't stop. There's no end in your supply. You are the healer. You're the provider. You're the everything. I trust you. I'm leaning on you. Come on, somebody. You got to know faith. Without it, it's impossible to please God, but with faith, everything can happen. And then I ask you to participate on December the 5th. Don't set it out. We need to fill this building up just like it is right now, and we're going to have a giving party, and we're going to celebrate, and we're going to say, in your face, devil, and we're going to claim miracles, and we're going to claim healing, and we're going to claim provision, and we're going to claim restoration. I'm going to tell you, homes are going to be restored. Jobs are going to be restored. Miracles are going to happen. Come on, somebody. It's, I just believe it. Come on, let's sing it. I just believe it. I just believe it. It's too good to not believe. It's too good to not believe. It's too good to not believe. Come on, let's sing it together.